Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Sound good. Okay. Good. Well, welcome back from the break. Um, as I mentioned, my name is Becky Skeen, and I'm going to be giving you a brief overview of how to catalog audio materials, including oral histories. And we'll be focusing on those areas of the bibliographic record that are vastly different from other formats. So let's get started. Let's see. Okay. All right, so when most of you think of sound recordings, you might think of some of these items that you see here in this slide. Um, a CD, cassette tape, cylinders for those who <laughs> are familiar with, I guess, more special collections of materials. <clears throat> of course, vinyl records, and then re real uh, tapes. Um, but, but for cataloging, it depends on what kind of recording is on those carriers as to how we create the new bibliographic record. All right, so sound recordings are split into two groups for cataloging, non-musical sound recordings and musical sound recordings. Uh, non-musical sound recordings are considered recordings of non-musical sounds on any media, including online resources. This includes such things as interviews, lectures, podcasts, and audiobooks. It can even include sounds in nature and sound effects. Musical sound recordings are recordings of music on any media, including online resources. Examples include music recorded on audio cartridges, audio cylinders, audio discs, audio cassettes, audio tape reels, and so on. Um, when cataloging these materials, you will use the sound recordings work form and connection, I will, and we will be using RDA and DAX as our main cataloging standards. All right, starting at the top of the record, the fixed fields for sound recordings should have the type as either an I for non-musical sound recordings or as a J for musical sound recordings. And the bibliographical, bibliographic level should be collection or monograph item, depending on if you're doing what you're cataloging at that time. Other elements such as descriptive cataloging form, encoding level, date, et cetera, will be filled out the same way as other formats. However, there are two other elements that are optional for sound recordings, which are literary text for sound recordings, which is used for non-musical sound recordings and describes the type of spoken word or sounds that can be found on the items being described. Common options include autobiography, conference proceedings, how-to instructions, lectures, poetry, and interviews. The other optional element is form of composition for musical sound recordings. Form of composition is a two character code that identifies the form of music on the recording. The, chords, the codes are assigned from a, a controlled vocabulary created by the Library of Congress. Examples are included, that I've included in my slide here are ballads, carols, folk music, hymns, operas, songs, and this is not a complete list. There's quite a long list but I have a link to it there in my slide to the full list. So you can look at those later. Um, once the fixed field elements have been completed, we can move down to the variable field, starting with the 007. The uh, 007 is used to code the physical characteristics of the sound recordings and are usually broken out by class of physical object to which an item belongs. Um, you will need to create a separate 007 for each class of materials in a collection. Some of the same information entered here in the 007 will later be entered in the 344 field. Once we get to that, and you will see that there's um, a parallel in those descriptions. We start by entering an S for sound recordings in the subfield A. This is used for both non-musical and musical sound recordings. Next, we move to subfield B, our specific material designations. And Again, I did not have room to list all of them, but a few of the more common codes that you can find are for sound discs, um, remote, which is for digital sound recordings, sound cassette, and sound tape reel. Subfield D is for the playback speed of a certain class of sound recording. Here again, this is just a few commonly used codes, not a complete list. So you see the playback speeds include 33 and one third revolutions per minute which is the speed of some phonograph records, 1.4 meters per second for compact discs, 
one and seven eighth inches per second for standard audio, audio cassettes, and then the standard not applicable, unknown, and other. You'll find those in pretty much all of them as a catch-all for anything that you may come across. Subfield E is the configuration of playback channels or basically how the sound comes out when playing the sound recording. Um, any subfield and subfield F is only used for discs and cylinders and codes the width of the groove for discs or the pitch of the groove for cylinders, which means basically how they were recorded onto those different medias. And I've given several examples of both of these. Um, the playback channels and the grooves width. All right. Next, we have a subfield G, which codes the dimensions of the items. And you will see on several of these subfields that I do not have the room to list all the options available, obviously, and have instead included some of the more commonly used codes. So we have a 10 inch diameter, which is standard for vinyl records or phonograph records. Um, your typical um, commercially produced ones that you see. Four and three quarter inches standard for a, a compact disc. And then we have the standards for cassette tape and then the, uh, the of course, not applicable unknown and other. Um, Subfill H records the width of the tape on the item. Um, the most common is one eighth inch and that's most cassettes have that. It's the standard small cassette that you think of when you think of a, of a cassette. Um, there is also a quarter inch. There is not applicable. That just means that it's for sound recordings that don't have a tape, obviously like compact discs and, and um, phonograph records. Um, and then there's your unknown and other as well as the other dimensions here. And of course, you just have to pick which one matches up with the items, item or items that you have in hand. So the eyes and the tracks on a tape, um, this usually pertains to a cassette. Uh, so there are half track, which is two channels, quarter, which is four, eight track, and then the not applicable unknown and other. Um, kind of disc or cylinder is subfield I. Commonly used codes um, are master tape, instantaneous recorded on the spot. That just means it's original recording that you've taken to a lecture or something and you're just recording it on your own device and it's not professionally done. Mass produced um, for commercial recordings and then uh, not applicable unknown and other. So K okay is the kind of material used in the manufacture of sound recordings, um, both instantaneous and mass produced. So we have plastic with metal, not applicable, plastic, unknown, other, um, they're a, a fair list of all these things. And then the subfield M codes the playback characteristics for sound recordings, including special equipment or equalization necessary for proper playback and should only be used if it's clearly indicated on the item. So if it doesn't clearly say one of these things that's Dolby being encoded or digital recorded recording or that you know for sure, then you should not use this um, subfield, however, if it is clearly displayed on the item or you can clearly tell, then you can, you can go ahead and include it. All right. And finally, we have the subfield N, which is used to code the process, used to originally capture and store the recording. Not all of these subfields are required and they can be left off if they do not pertain to the item. So I know in several cases I haven't used all the items that I've just listed or all the subfields that I've listed only the ones that I know pertain to my um, collections of materials. When we put them all together, the O7s will look similar to this example that I give here. Um, subfield A is S for sound recording. B is a sound reel tape. Um, the rest of them, we obviously, we didn't know the speed or the playback channel, so those were used. And then it, does, it is not a disc or cylinder and it has a seven inch diameter and a quarter inch tape. That's what all of that tells you. So the tape configuration is unknown and it's an acetate tape with ferrous oxide and it was captured using electrical techniques and stored as modulations and pulses on a magnetic surface.
very technical in in all of our background, but it helps with when people are trying to find certain types of materials. Next, we move on to the 028 field of the publisher, uh, which is the publisher or dis distributor number. These are generally found on um, commercial sound recordings. They're assigned by a publisher or, a, or distributor. Um, and the first indicator shows the type of number that will be recorded. And there are two indicators used for sound recordings, which are zero and one. Zero is the issue number assigned by a publisher to a specific sound recording or portion of sound recording. It can usually be found on the record label, but in some instances, maybe on the packaging. So I would look first at the label to see if you can find some kind of issue number. It's usually um, capital letters with a space and then the number. And I've seen it handwritten on there, it's printed on labels, handwritten. You just have to um, look for it, those types of, of numbers. Um, the matrix number tells you what master was, you, was used in the pressing of a specific recording. To create the field, the assigned number goes in the subfield A, while the entity who assigned the number, the publisher or distributor, goes in the subfield B, leaving subfield Q to be used as needed for other important or useful information. As you can see in the example that I provided, that's kind of what the numbers look like. You see the, the capital letters at the beginning of a number and then the number itself. And then you have the entity that assigned that number to that item. <clears throat> um, we also see uh, the subfield Q. That can be anything that can be on label. It can be disk one or disk two. It's just information that if you have if you have multiples, that would help you distinguish on where they found that information. All right. Continuing down our mark record, we move to the creator or the 1XX field. The 1XX field can be used for a single creator of a single work or if they, if they are the main creator for a compilation of works, you can also use a single creator. However, if there are multiple contributors to an expression, then the 1XX field is not used and the main access becomes the title. The contributors can be added in the, at that point in the appropriate 7XX field with the corresponding relator term if wanted or needed and would help with identification or access. Um, it's actually, the relator codes are, are very important in these cases. For oral histories, use the name of the person being interviewed in the 100 field with the relator term interviewee. And that's per um, DAX Appendix 19, I believe. And add the interviewer viewer in a 700 field with a relator term of interviewer. Recordings of conference proceedings have the name of the conference as the 1XX. And here are listed some of the main uh, standard rules there on this page. All right, so most original non-professional sound recordings will not have a given title. So if it's something that somebody hand recorded on their, by themselves, then of course they usually don't go to the effort of printing a big fancy label or or making lots of copies of it. And so you may just have some handwriting on, on a label or a paper attached or you don't know. In the case that um, if, you, if there's not a given title, then you, the, you as a cataloger will need to devise one. And as they mentioned in the previous um, things, um, presentations by Ali and uh, Becca, they, Devising a title um, can be constructed by using DAX rules, I don't, yeah, 2.3.1. And according to DAX, um, use, you use, there's three segments to a devised title. <laughs> they can be used together or separately to build a title. These segments are name of the person, organization, et cetera, that is responsible for the creation of the materials. The nature of the materials being dis described, such as oral histories, lectures, etc., and then the subject of the material being described can also be included, prominent, and adds value to the record. All segments are not required to be used when creating a title. Um, use those segments that fit your materials and local procedures for those. And um, I've given uh, one example here. 
fax also requires that date or dates of material to be added for collections dates can be added in subfield f and g subfield f, f in the 245 is for inclusive dates and subfield g for bulk dates and usually you use inclusive dates you can use inclusive dates by yourself by its own on its own bulk dates generally you have both inclusive dates and bulk dates but you can also just do yeah bulk it depends on your procedures for your local institution if an item contains a given title like a commercially processed um, musical recording or something you re record the title as it appears on the item chief source of information for sound recordings in this case is the item label if the label is insufficient title information can be taken from a company material such as the container or insert All right, the physical description for sound recording consists of the extent and the dimension of the material. So subfield A and C, they used to have B, but that has now been broken out in RDA into a separate 344 field. So um, extent is the number of the physical items being represented by the record, superseded by the term used in the carrier type field. So your carrier type, the 338, that is the term that you want to use and then it's just the number of items um, such as five audio discs or 11 audio cassettes then that is followed in the subfield a by the playing dur dur duration if it's known um, you can also i guess listen to it and count it if it's not long um, playing duration can contain hours minutes and seconds or any one of those individually such as this many minutes According to DAX for collections, the extent, the extent can be number of items, containers or carriers, or the amount of storage space used as linear feet. And I've given examples of that with some parallel um, descriptions there. All right. For dimension, you just need to know the size of the item being described in the record, such as four and three quarter inches for compact discs or seven inches with one half inch tape for um, some audio cassettes. So, all right. Moving on to the 33X fields. Um, for non musical sound recordings, the content, content type 330, 336 can be spoken word or sounds and perform music for musical sound recordings. Uh, the media type is audio for all types, or both types, non-musical and musical is the same. Carrier type can be any one of these listed here, such as audio cartridge, audio belt, audio cylinder, audio disc, soundtrack reel, audio roll, audio wire reel, audio cassette, audio tape reel, and an other as a catch-all, in case one of the other ones doesn't quite fit with you what you have. Now we move on to the sound characteristics that I said used to be in the 300 field. They've now broken, broken them out in RDA and they prefer when you list them that you separate the 344s for each unique term. So one bibliographic record may contain several 344s depending on, on what you have. So they only want one item in each line. Um, we have the type of recording, which is the method of playback, either analog or digital. And there is the recording medium, which is how the sound was recorded onto the carrier. So magnetic and optical. And all of these um, subfields have specific RDA controlled vocabularies. Well, not all of them. Most of them have RDA controlled vocabularies, and I've listed them here. So they and link out to them so that you can um, go directly to those if you need. There is the playing speed, which is the speed at which the audio carriers play to produce sound. Also, the groove characteristics for discs and cylinders. So here again, these 344s. Remember when we were doing the 07s? It's the same kind of information that was there in code is now written out and is available for viewing to the patron in an understandable way. Um, 
as well as there's also track configuration and tape configuration. And finally, configuration of playback channels and special playback characteristics. There, you can also use the Soundfield 3 in the 344 in the same way that you use it in other um, fields as a way to distinguish what part of the described material is being represented by that specific 344. This can be especially useful in collection catalog, collections cataloging um, that contain multiple material types. So it's, in, it's important to include those and they're very useful. For notes, you should include a note for the source of the title, specifically for those created by the cataloger. Also other collection or item specific details that increase discoverability and access. Content notes can be especially useful for musical sound recordings to help patients find certain songs or titles or performers. I've used it on several occasions that way and I've had patrons look it up that way. And so it is very useful if you can add that kind of information. I mean, obviously you can use it in other um, cataloging records other than just musical sound recordings, but in this specific case, it has been extremely helpful in my experience to have it in the musical sound recordings. And then the 520 summary note um, can give a lot more detail about a collection or an item. And those are, that is very important as well. <clears throat> Other five XX notes that can be added, um, if you see fit or according to your local procedures. Um, some of the useful fields that I have found that I use in, in some of my cataloging of these types of materials have been 506, restrictions on access, the 511, participant or performer note, that can be especially important for um, musical sound recordings. Um, preferred citation of described materials, 540 terms governing use and reproduction, immediate source of acquisition, location of other archival materials, either within your library or in another library. I've used both. Language of the material in case so it's more clear to people that it, it might be in a different language other than um, English. Cumulative index or finding aid, these are important for collections um, when you're cataloging any kind of collections. If you can um, link out to that or talk, talk um, or mention that there is finding aid available and where it is. And then ownership and custodial history. Subject headings are always important and can add it can aid in the discoverability of materials. In the subject headings manual, H2230, you can find guidance for non-musical sound recordings. They've lumped them in with visual materials in this instance, not sure why, but in general subject headings um, should be added, in general subject headings should be added for all important topics related to non-musical sound recordings, also places and persons of importance that you may wanna draw attention to or that you know somebody may want to search. Um, for musical sound recordings, it can be easy to find subject headings by searching music. The Library of Congress subject headings database. Um, the entry for music includes subdivisions that can be used and also has a list of narrow terms that can lead to other effective subject headings. This is the browsing that Be Becca was talking about earlier. Um, where if you find one subject heading, it can sometimes lead you to another one. This so is like breadcrumbs that you follow, whichever way you may take you. Furthermore, the subdivision songs and music can be used to qualify many types of subject headings as a topical or form subdivision. For genre headings, for non-musical sound recordings, search the Library of Congress genre of form, genre and form term database. For specific forms of recordings, common ones that are available include interviews, oral histories, lectures, sermons, speeches, et cetera. And I've given a couple examples of some of these. Um, 
For musical sound recording, start again by searching LC's genre um, form term database for music. The entry includes a list of narrower terms, which can be used as additional genre headings. Again, just like subject headings, they can lead you to other things that you may had not, you may not have realized were available to you. Uh, the most common form subdivision is songs and music for musical sound recordings. And I've given some examples of both of these types. All right, here are some other resources that might be helpful to you in your cataloging. Um, we have the RBMS genre terms, the art and architecture thesaurus, and there's some best practices guide, best practice guides from the Music Library Association, um, which all may be helpful to you in cataloging these materials. Thank you. And I will switch over to Nicole. Okay. Okay, hopefully everyone can see that. Um, so hi everyone, I am Nicole Lewis and I'm going to be talking about cataloging video collections and individual videos. I'll kind of group them in together. And I realize it's um, after three o'clock on a Friday. So we're, you know, we're all hitting the weekend sort of anticipation and mid-afternoon sort of slump time. And as grouping as cataloging can be, <laughs> hopefully everyone can stay awake um, and stay with me. Um, a lot of the things that I have, well, a lot of the things that I'll cover has in some extent, or to some extent already been mentioned by any one of my um, colleagues here. Uh, so, so I might just kind of breeze past some things that seem uh, slightly repetitive. But when we're talking about videos or video collections, we're thinking of mostly um, like motion pictures, so films, film reels um, of various sizes. We're talking about cassettes, video cassettes. So here's a picture of a VHS, but there are several other kinds of cassettes, um, be they beta or umatic, super VHS, um, there's a number of kind of cassettes that videos can come on, uh, as well as uh, discs, so video discs, such as a DVD, um, laser disc, Blu-ray. Um, we're gonna be talking about kind of all of these, all of these things. Uh, when it comes to uh, collections, um, one thing that I wanted to mention before we get into that is that the collections themselves may or may not have been um, conceived or published as a finite set. So this, um, in special collections, uh, most of you might know that um, these could be assembled prior to acquisition. So um, a donor has accumulated a bunch of videos, group them all together for you, uh, and perhaps they want them cataloged in that type of a collection. It could also be assembled by the repository uh, because it makes sense in some cataloging way or in some collection way. They can be grouped by provenance, provenance um, some administrative decision or curatorial decision. And collection could be as small as two items or large enough to count by container. So we're talking, when I say collection, it could be any size um, formed under any of these reasons. For the cataloging guidelines, um, uh, specifically for like description, especially, there's three um, formats that uh, seem to come up um, or be used. One is the archiving, archival moving image materials. And I don't know if that's very commonly used now, but there are quite a few um, records from the Library of Congress cataloged under this format. Um, largely, those 
these are largely like motion pictures or film reels as far as I could see. Um, and then we also have RDA uh, and I'm kind of including in this the Bibco standard record um, and I'll explain in a minute why I've got a picture of that here. And then DAX as um, has been previously talked about. So the archival moving image materials, um, I'm going to call it AMIM. This is the second edition. It was published in 2000. So it's um, it's getting old. It, it's based largely on AACR2 and um, ISDB rules. Um, and it typically, the guidelines within it recommend that works be cataloged separately, although it does include in an appendix um, some collection level cataloging guidelines. And I've included here the 040 subfield E code for this. Um, it looks like it's um, it might only be available in Catalogger's desktop, so I don't have uh, a direct link to this for you. Um, the next is RDA, or I'm including Bibco Standard Record, mostly because um, I find that the Bibco Standard Record is a good and quick reference for RDA, uh, especially as uh, it relates to like saying what's core for RDA or what's not, um, as well as including a direct reference to RDA within RDA for the different types of information or description that's added. And there is um, a subsection in the BSR um, specifically for moving materials or moving images. Um, and so it, it gives a little bit of extra kind of tips as well. Um, and then lastly, there's DAX and um, it's already been previously talked about it's good to, for supplying titles, creators, um, production information. Um, I have a different link here to the one that Rebecca um, included before, but um, either is a good location. Um, I'm also, I've also got here a couple of um, cataloging best practice documents. Both of these were written by OLAC or the online AV catalogers group. Uh, one is for the best practices for cataloging DVD, video, and Blu-ray discs. Um, not that these would necessarily be largely um, held in special collections, but um, for anything commercially produced, at least these are uh, really good. This is a really good guideline for those. Um, and then streaming media, just in case anyone has a need for it. I, they also have this best practices for cataloging streaming media. I know it's that's slightly different from like um, moving image, but I guess it's kind of a moving image. So anyway, just kind of throwing that in as an addition. Uh, so I'm going to kind of move through the record like my colleagues have. Um, for fixed field information, this is going to typically be a projected medium, so a G value in the type. And then um, there's three possibilities for the bibliographic level of collection if you're doing a collection record um, and monograph or item M. But if you're cataloging an individual item that's also part of a collection, you can use D for a subunit. Um, for the 008 stuff or other fixed fields, um, these are some possible date types. Um, P is particularly used if the date of distribution or release and the production date are different. So um, if something was videotaped in 1990, but not distributed until like 2010, then this would, that would be um, a scenario where you might use the P. And then I and K are specific for collections. We've also got um, running time. And there's three options here. Um, if you know, if you have a large collection, you're probably not necessarily going to know um, how long the running time is for all of the videos to combine. So, you know, there is an option uh, for it to do an unknown. Uh, the the TMAT or the type of visual material here, we're going to talk about either motion picture M or B for video recording. And then the technique um, is going to be either animation, animation and live action, live action, and then other. And I've added here, the other can include anything like time-lapse, 
um, trick cinematography, micro cinematography, um, videos made from still images with, uh, I think that should be without animation. Anyway, um, so anything else that might not be classified as, as strictly animation or live action, we're gonna group it under other. The 007 field uh, gets pretty complex, so I'm really, I'm not gonna waste everyone's time um, or sanity by going through each one of these. So um, there are links here to the Mark 21 um, standards for both of these, um, but your 007 field for the motion picture is gonna really get into the nitty gritty of, of the format of the film. Um, and the video, just like the video recording one is gonna get into um, the recording format, um, things about the cassette or or uh, disc as well. So when you're formulating this field, um, refer to the guidelines for that. And um, because this is from the Mark 21 guidelines, these are um, the character positions. So if, if you regularly use OCLC, um, you can find these same uh, similar guidelines in the OCLC bid formats. The O2, O24 field, the other standard identifier, um, you'll probably find on more commercially published uh, video recordings. So this is going to be like your, your international standard recording code, your UPC symbol. Um, you might not use the music number. I just kind of threw in all the possibilities on here, I think. Um, so you're going to pick which kind of code for the first indicator. And then your second indicator is going to be if um, it's going to indicate if there's a difference between a scanned number and the, the I readable form. And I think probably most commonly people aren't going to code this, but if it is uh, significant to your library, then you will want to code the second indicator. Um, and then I have a couple of examples here. Let's see, one is the UPC code. Um, the second one is uh, coming from a different source. Similar to sound recordings, there's an 028 with a publisher or distributor number. Um, the typical indicators uh, for the first indicator is going to be a four for video recording publisher number or a six for a distributor number. And then um, second indicator, if you want it as an added entry or note. And then some examples. Um, these first three here are from an actual set. So two discs that are published together, they have three different publisher, um, three different publisher numbers. And these are typically like the sound recording is going to be found on the label on the disc or either on the container or package. Um, and this one you see there's one for the set and then each disc has an individual one. And then the, um, the bottom two are from another individual example where there is a there is one number for the publisher and then a separate number for the distributor and those are added in, in two separate fields and the field is repeatable so use as many as you need for creators um i i've just put the the references here to the different standards because i mean they're too, they're kind of hard to summarize <laughs> um so you can refer to these for like full, the full guidelines. But kind of um, a summary for creators for collections, uh, you can record a creator in a 1xx field when all materials have the same personal creator or emanate from a single corporate body. Um, and then you can add additional creators uh, if there are others who created the collection for names of collections um, author title headings, and then when um, when the repository is a compiler, rather than use the 1xx, um, consider using a title main entry and then adding the repository name to a 710 or 7xx field. And this is just one example. So this George Stevens um, collected all of. I didn't have. I didn't add the title here. I apologize, but he's a collector of all of the items in this collection. And so we can add him in a 100 field since he's uh, since he created it. For individual fields, uh, individual films, um, 
assign a creator to a 1xx only when that agent has sole responsibility for creating the work. So this person and only that person was involved. And so the example I have here is um, Leland Oslender. He was the filmmaker and the sole creator for uh, this Venice Beach in the 60s. But this type of situation um, is going to be relatively rare, especially for commercially produced motion pictures and, and videos. Maybe um, not so much for the real specialized stuff that you might get. Um, but most, most of the moving image materials are going to be collaborative, and so all the creators are going to be entered in 7xx fields. When it comes to titles, um, I've just got a brief summary of the guidelines here um, for the title and the preferred source of information. Um, basically for the, under RDA we're going to transcribe uh, because it's more than likely going to be on um, the title screen or, or the title frames. Um, under AMIM we want to use the original release title in the country production. So we're not going to translate it or anything. Um, and then DAX, uh, you know, record a formal title according to the uh, appropriate companion standard. Um, the preferred sources of information is, is typically going to be under RDA, the title frame or frames or the title screen. Um, if the film itself, once you start playing it, doesn't have either of those, then you can use the first applicable source with a formally presented title, um, which could most likely be um, something written on the disc label or set label or <laughs> some kind of container. Um, let's see, okay. So if there's not any of those, or not a formal title, we're gonna devise a title. Um, we've already talked in depth um, several times about DAX, so I'm not gonna talk about that. Uh, this, the formulation under AMIM for devising a title is, is very similar to DAX. And then here's a guideline for RDA. We want to use, um, it needs to indicate the nature of the subject, could be opening words of a text, um, and it could be any one or all of these, although you know, we probably don't want it to be too lengthy. And here's some examples for some devised titles. Uh, a couple of examples under DAX. Again, we were including a name element with um, a collection or type of material. Um, under Amim, under Amim, excuse me, uh, these are a couple of examples of of devised titles as well. So kind of more general. Um, the first one, television news programs, clips, and then the secondary one, um, Theodore Roosevelt takes it inaugural ceremony with a date. Um, publication and distribution information. If you're using RDA, it's important to note that um, the RDA definition of production is not the same as the um, video or film definition of production. So it's important not to um, confuse the two. But basically, you're going to use the production statement um, 2.7 in RDA if you have an unpublished manifestation. And then any of the other three, publication, distribution, or manufacture, you're going to use the published manifestation. Um, AMIM, the guidelines are in chapter four. Excuse me, chapter four of that standard. Um, typically for the place of publication or distribution, they prefer to use the country of origin. So not like a city or a state, uh, but it would be like United States if it was published here. Um, and then DAX really only gives guidance for, the, for a date. And that's the information there. Um, here's some examples, again, at, at the top for some collections. If we're looking at a range of dates, um, you can include just the, the range or itself. You can also include um, additional years for when the bulk of the collection and the dates for the bulk of the collection. And then um, the bottom is some individual examples. So these first three, uh, the United States, CBS Blu-ray uh, is the public publisher, 
Chatsworth, California, Image Entertainment, that's the distributor, and then you also have a copyright. So you're, you're gonna have multiple fields here. And this bottom example is from the AMIM. So again, United States, uh, we're just recording the country. And then we've got a uh, publisher and then approximate, approximate publication date. For physical description, um, under RDA, you're gonna use a set of predefined terms, um, which I just realized I only included for the video stuff, not the motion picture. So please see the 3.3.1.3 um, for some more information. Um, and I'll let you guys kind of read through this because uh, I'm kind of running low on time. Uh, basically for the dimensions for the 300C, you're gonna record the gauge of the film or the video cassette or the diameter of the disc. Um, and under AMEM, you can include the type of film base as well if it's, uh, if it's needed. And DAX doesn't give any guidelines for either dimensions or the other physical information. So it just sends you, you know, tells you to look to another standard for those. And here's some examples under each um, for under each guideline. Something just picked me out. Okay, hang on a second. I need to reshare. Again, I'm not sure what happened. Okay, can everyone see that? <laughs> am, I, am I back on track? Yeah, you're good. Okay, cool, thank you. Okay, 3-3x three, three fields, if you're using RDA, you're gonna use one of these two for the content, three-dimensional or two-dimensional moving image. Uh, media type is gonna be either projected or video. And then there's a couple of different, um, more options for the carrier type. Um, this first group is gonna be for motion pictures. And the second group is going to be for videos. And as you can see, both options have an other in the subfield A, but the subfield B is different. So for motion picture, the code is MZ, whereas for video recording, it's BZ. Um, Becky mentioned the three, four X fields. These are, um, I'm not going to go through all of these, but these are meant to enhance the record more and kind of help prepare it for a type of conversion from mark to the frame or whatever. Um, so they've added these additional fields and I've included the RDA instruction here to refer to when you are adding um, these fields. So you're gonna have 340s, 344, 346 of 347 as possibilities for uh, video recordings. And these are um, a couple of examples. So the left column and the right column are both from individual videos and you can see you can add any or as many as appropriate for your item. For five, 500 notes, you want to include the source of the title, especially if, um, if you've devised the title. You might also want to include a note about who compiled the collection if that is significant to your institution. The 520 field um, is important for a couple of reasons. Um, for individual movies, um, LC practice is to add summaries, which, you know, just helps patrons know what the thing is about. Um, AMIM, AMIM says the same thing for individual. And then for collections, AMIM and DAX both um, require scope and contents notes, or you can add more information about um, the things that are included in the collection. Um, the 505 is useful for um, individual item information and collection, similar to um, musical sound recordings um, with individual track titles. This is going to be good if probably not so fun to make if you have a large collection of videos, but at least for smaller collections, um, you can put in the uh, individual title information. And then other notes, um, as you might prefer, uh, restrictions or citations, um, source of acquisition. You can link to a finding aid. Um, 
in like a 555 as well, if that's important um, for a collection. And then for individual titles, um, specifically 508 notes with production credit information, 511 performers, um, 521, you can put a film rating in there and then any system details if you have like a special format. Uh, Becky already kind of talked about this in relation to non-music sound recordings, but for videos, basically, um, the general rule is to don't add pictorial works to a form subdivision. And then it, there's some guidelines for particular places when they appear in the films, um, if there's particular people, and then for special types of films. So I was going to give guidance if you've got fictional films, foreign language teaching films, juvenile films, or films for the hearing or impaired, um, or people with disabilities. So I recommend you, um, especially if you have one of these special types, to look at this, um, to look at these guidelines. Uh, we have LC John Reform Thesaurus. Um, the OLAC, or not the OLAC, OLAC has a useful list of all the LCGFT terms that can be used for the images, as well as a best, best practices document for applying those. Um, and that could be anything like um, animated films or uh, fast action, I don't know, I'm just kind of making these up, but something that will describe the film. And then there's also um, these other thesauri that can be utilized as well for an, um, for other uh, descriptive terms for the item that you have. And with that, I'm going to pass it back to Allie. Thanks, let me share my screen again. All right, and really quickly before we uh, wrap this all up, I wanna talk about cataloging multi-format collections. And so these are collections of materials in two or more forms, and they're related um, by having been accumulated by a particular person or they're about a particular person or corporate body. Um, and so this will be uh, like a family history collection that has photos and diaries and you know, home movies and things like that. Um, or as I mentioned in my previous uh, presentation, if you have a collection that includes both projected and non-projected graphics, so let's say um, slides and photo prints, that would also be a, a multi-format collection. In an OCLC connection, these are cataloged on the mixed materials work form. In the fixed field, the type of record is P for mixed materials, and the bibliographic collection, or the bibliographic level is C for collection. If you have one item, it's not multi-format. That's just how words work. Uh, again, for the title, you're probably not going to have a formal collection title, so make sure that the catalog or supplied title is as descriptive as possible. Um, but this is something that you can and probably should negotiate with your donor, um, especially if this is a newer acquisition. Um, you know, the archivist uh, default might be to name the collection after the donor, but if you have someone sharing uh, materials that were primarily created by their parents or grandparents, for example, they may prefer to have their names on the collection instead of the donor's names. Um, so, so just be mindful of that uh, and make sure that when you can, you are talking with the donor and getting their input. We have some examples uh, that follow the guidelines on DAX 2.3.3. Uh, Rosemary Williams Collection on Utah History. Rosemary Williams is the name segment. Collection is the nature of materials. And the topical segment is Utah History. Or we have this very generic O'Neill Family Collection. And once again, I want to emphasize, you don't need to have you know, every single kind of material listed out in the title. So just say it's the collection, not the O'Neill family photograph manuscript and video cassette collection. It just doesn't need to be broken down that much. I would like to point out that the 007, the 264, and the 300 fields are repeatable. Uh, so you can put as many of them as are going to be helpful uh, in your record. Um, and in the subfield three, I believe, you can usually specify which particular materials you're referencing within those fields. The 33X fields are also repeatable. Um, I've given links here to the control vocabularies for all of those fields so that you can just explore them. Uh, and in multi-format collections, it's especially important to um, have very full scope and content notes um, because sometimes, especially with very large collections, 
there, there's just a lot of ground to cover. You know, let's say you have um, fa a family history collection and you have diaries from when a grandparent was living in New York in the 1890s, but all the photographs are from when the family was living in Salt Lake City in the 1960s. You know, if someone's looking for diaries from the 1960s, that collection's not going to be useful to them. And if you're looking from photos from the 1890s, it won't be useful to them. Uh, so really do specify um, and give as much information as is going to be helpful to patrons. Uh, and that includes for the subject and genre form terms as well. Um, you know, really try to be specific, use those subfield V codes um, to specify, you know, which content goes with which subject heading. Um, you know, and, and above all else, just put as much information as is going to be helpful for your patrons. Uh, and again, get in that researcher's mindset of who's going to use this and for what purpose. And I know this was a very, very fast and uh, very content loaded uh, presentation. So we do thank you for watching today. Um, we have some time left for any questions. Uh, either about this second part or anything that you heard in the first part of our presentation. Uh, and here is all of our contact information. Uh, if there's something we didn't cover, if there's something that comes up later you'd like to ask us, please just reach out directly. We are always happy to talk to people. And I especially love hearing about weird stuff that pops up in people's collections. I say I'm not surprised anymore, but please test me. I would like to be surprised. Uh, if you have any questions, please type them in the chat box and we will answer. Thank you. Sounds like there aren't any questions. Thank you guys so much. What a wonderful presentation. Oh, looks like we do have a question now from Orem. How have you helped public libraries or historical societies in the past with cataloging archival materials? Any success stories? I have to say nothing in particular comes to mind for me um, other than you know, conducting trainings like this. Um, but again, if, if people from any kind of institution have questions, I'm always happy to be emailed directly and answer. Yeah, I haven't had anybody, I haven't worked with public libraries or historical societies either, other than um, doing these types of presentations. But yeah, the same for me, I'm willing to help other anybody who needs any help. Great, thanks guys. Are there any other last minute questions before we all depart? Okay, well, this is Rita. I just want to thank Allie, Rebecca, Nicole, and Becky for their really comprehensive and specialized cataloging instruction. This was really an incredible presentation. And this concludes our workshop day. All of our sessions have been recorded and you will be notified when the videos are available for viewing and how to access them. I hope you've enjoyed attending the 2020 virtual ULA Fall Workshop and have a fabulous weekend.